Hey everybody, welcome to episode 115 of the Ask Dap Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. On this episode, we talk about B8 S4 versus a Mark 6 Golf R, putting seat covers on your Volkswagen or Audi front seats, and clean the screen on your Haldex pump while doing a service. Okay, so before we get into our questions, just wanna preface this episode with saying I'm guess, just getting over being sick. So uh, just bear with me there. Also, I wanna, want a quick announcement. Two shows that we're gonna be going to that I wanna to start to try to talk about more, which I haven't done a good job of in the past of talking about shows we are going to be going to. Two shows that we are planning to at this point, um, I'm gonna be going to uh, Wookiee in the Woods. Potentially some people from here will also probably be with me and I'll definitely be with Charles the Home Mechanic. We'll probably do some stuff together there. Uh, and then European Experience in uh, Savannah, Georgia. If you're not familiar with that, really cool show. Savannah's a really cool city. Um, so you should check out both of those events. I'll make sure I link to both of those in the description below where you can check that out. And again, bear with the uh, nasally voice of me getting over being sick. Let's get into our questions. Eric via Facebook says, does anyone know if they have front seat covers for the Mark 7? I'm trying to stay away from the universal ones as they don't fit the best. Okay, so seat covers for your Mark 7. Uh, so seat covers for any Volkswagen or Audi or really probably any current day car, I absolutely do not recommend. Uh, seat covers, here are the problems with seat covers. Uh, all, pretty much all current day models, specifically Volkswagen and Audi, have airbag in the seat. So if you're sitting on the driver's side, on the side bolster of the seat, there's an airbag. So if it, if you have either a rollover or in the, in the uh, event of a side collision, your airbag goes off. Um, if you have a seat cover wrapped around that seat, that airbag is not going to go off or not gonna go off properly. And if set off, you know, if you're not familiar, airbags put out a ton of heat when they go off uh, because they are basically a pyrotechnic that, that makes the bag uh, ignite. If you have a seat cover on there and the airbag potentially doesn't move at all or can't possibly ex expand the way it's supposed to, potentially there's a fire hazard. You know, if nothing else, it certainly will, will not protect you the way it's supposed to in the first place. Uh, and I know some people have mentioned uh, in the comments on this thing that there, was, there are ones with cutouts or potentially, uh, I know some things exist with, uh, that's supposed to have tear away stitching where it's supposed to blow open uh, in the event of this type of circumstance. Here's a couple of things I, I worry about with that type of thing. If it's not a factory seat cover, which Volkswagen does not make any, they don't exist uh, for any front seats. They do have one for the rear, but it's only uh, basically a layover. It doesn't wrap around like you would think for a normal seat cover on a, the driver side or passenger side front seats where they actually wrap around the whole uh, upper part of the uh, backrest. But because of that, I definitely don't recommend it. They're not designed properly for it. So even if you have a hole in it, there's no way for, they're made generically. So there's no way for them to know that it's going to clear any airbag in the first place and not have it you know, partially set off or maybe it sets off odd so that it, you know, it's not functioning properly. To me, this type of thing, if you need a seat cover, they are replaceable from Volkswagen Audi. They're not cheap, uh, you know, or you can always have an upholstery shop repair stuff. That, those would be the two routes that I would personally go. Upholstery shop, you know, find one locally to you. They can either repair it and or replace it with new covers if they're completely destroyed. Cleaning is also a good option. Good detailers can, can do uh, wonders on, on seats like that. So professional detailers might be able to help you with whatever specific problem you're having. If it is torn or ripped, again, leather can be repaired as well by uh, an interior person. Some maybe some not always perfect, but they have, uh, you know, kind of repair patches and by professionals, they usually can make them look pretty good. And then the always the option of a seat cover. If you ever need a seat cover, we don't have stuff like that listed on our site because it's complicated with different models and applications and and um, equipment make a million different options for seat covers. But if you reach out to us with your VIN number, I can tell well, we can get you the correct one for your vehicle. I can tell you that most seat covers range probably from just guesstimating around three to five hundred dollars, depending on the, the vehicle, and that would be for you know, just for a backrest or a seat bottom, just for that seat cover itself. So if you were to be replacing a whole seat, 
it can get pretty expensive and you may be better off going into an upholstery shop to just rewrap both seats for you. Hackneo64 via YouTube says, Hey Paul, have you had to use a PDR guy to fix dents on your car yet? I used one and regret it because he did bad work on mine and drilled through the bottom of my hatch and door sill as a shortcut to fix some minor dings. For anybody not familiar with PDR, he's talking about paintless dent repair. Uh, so paintless dent repair, usually if anybody's not familiar, uh, anybody who has seen paintless dent repair or people who do that type of work, they have a lot of special tools, which are generally some sort of long metal implement that usually has some sort of different shape or angle of the, uh, of the tool. And they usually have a whole slew of them so that they can get into weird places on the vehicle. Now, with that said, your painless dent repair is not a perfect science of anything. All they're basically trying to do is figure out the best way to get out a dent on a vehicle. Now, what that often means is you're doing that as a cost savings. This is not some special service where they can work magic. Sometimes they have to do things like drill an additional hole because they have no other way to access what they need to get to to make that repair. Now, you could say that's a hack way to do things, or you could say they're trying to do the job to save you money. Now, should they, should they inform you before doing that? Yes, technically they should. Most people aren't going to care. They just want to get a dent out of their car and aren't going to care if there's a, a hole in some, some weird spot that they're never going to notice that they pop a grommet into. That's generally what, from my experience, what they do. The alternative to paintless dent repair is getting it fixed properly by a body shop. And, and so let's just throw out an example. I'm, and I'm just going to throw out some numbers that are probably guesstimates, but they're fairly accurate uh, for it. So let's say on a hatch, um, on your rear tailgate on your car, you have a, uh, a dent. You need to get that fixed and you can, you can go with either paintless dent repair and the guy is going to charge you 99 bucks. You can go with a body shop, which uh, they can either do it one of two ways. They can either uh, f fill it with Bondo uh, and, then, and then sand it down, prime it and paint it. Or uh, they can try to maybe chop out that piece of metal and weld a new one in, or they can replace the whole deck lid and have it painted. Now, if you go down the road of, of Bondo paint, that's gonna be much, much cheaper than the other options. But over time, Bondo tends to get a little bit of a wave to it and, uh, and will start to kind of come away from the vehicle. Now, not come away as in it just like falls off. It just has kind of a different um, uh, look and feel to it. So you can see Bondo on vehicles that have a bunch of Bondo on it. They're generally noticeable to the person with a kind of a keen eye to that type of body work. You can kind of recognize what it looks like. Um, then going down the road of welding in a panel, it probably depends on the person, what their skill set is, and if they're able to do it based on the angle of the piece of metal or whatever. I generally think that's not a repair most places are going to do because it's probably really time, uh, time consuming to do that. And it's maybe hard to get something that's a perfect fit for that. And so they would probably likely go down the road of um, replacing the deck lid. So let's just say the Bondo method with the uh, cleaning up, uh, sanding down, painting, let's say that costs 500. Uh, just as a rough guesstimate, it's probably semi-accurate. All the paint's gonna kind of, they're gonna try to blend it in from the rest of the hatch to that repaired area, and that's gonna be uh, your, your repair. Initially, it's gonna probably gonna look fine, and then over time, it will look a little bit less fine. The completely perfect way to to repair that would be to replace the deck lid. Deck lid's probably about 800 bucks, let's say. Uh, they have to paint it completely, remove the glass from the vehicle, uh, and then they have to blend in that with the bumper and the, and the rear quarter panels and the roof all together. So they're gonna have to paint kind of the rear fifth of your vehicle to blend the paint to make sure it all matches. And then they're gonna be replacing your deck lid, taking out the windshield or taking out the rear window, all that stuff. I would guesstimate that repair probably cost at least $2,000, just roughly, maybe more than that. Um, so it, as you can see, when we lay out the circumstances, paintless dent repair is something that exists as a viable repair, but it's not really a one-to-one -one ratio. And so saying that they use a shortcut by nature, paintless dent repair is a shortcut. So you have to understand that if you don't want things like that to happen, it's important to, for anybody to know that you have to be upfront with them and say, listen, if you need to drill holes and stuff to access things, I wanna make sure, I wanna know before you do that to determine whether I'd like to proceed with that specific repair.
So hopefully that shares a little bit of insight on that type of thing and uh, will help somebody in making a decision on that. Hackneo64 via YouTube says, it seems the DSG service video is not done properly and missed some critical steps like getting the temperature up to have the fluid expand and overflow drip out as well as a DSG adaptation. Are you going to make another? Okay, so uh, this was referencing a video that we shot with Charles the Home Mechanic a while back uh, talking about DSG services. Um, first of all, yes, I actually am looking for a uh, someone with a Mark 7 Golf R that's local to us that we can possibly shoot a Haldex service video as well as a DSG service video at some time in the, in the future. Uh, it's something that we're looking at doing because I want to show the proper procedure for people who have questions like this. But more importantly, I want to touch on this. Um, a lot of people, sporadically we get comments on that video that say that it wasn't done properly, we missed steps and that type of thing. It's really important to understand that the way that we showed that in that video are basically the way every shop would do it when servicing your DSG transmission. And let me explain to you why. Uh, so the proper method is around a filling procedure. I don't have the specs on me right now, but let's say, I wanna say it's somewhere around like filling the transmission and you start at, I don't know, 30 degrees centigrade. And you start filling and you fill between 30 and 38 degrees centigrade. And that's when you will have your optimum temperature for filling your DSU transmission. So here's where the issue lies. This is generally a, a uh, an issue around getting the service done properly when it comes to figuring out all the logistics of that. And, and somewhere along the way, someone has determined, uh, done the kind of figuring of how much fluid they generally take. And, and that's what's using kind of that fill it till it's done method for filling transmissions. And again, this is the repair that's gonna be done at, at the large majority of shops. And let me explain to you why. First of all, I don't believe it's a concern because shops have been doing this for a very, very long time. This is including dealers uh, who are gonna be doing it this way. And there have been no concerns around DSGs around that type of service thing. More importantly, because of the, the requirements of that fill method, the transmission is gonna to have to be cold. Now, because the car would be cold means you would have to leave the vehicle overnight to allow somebody to properly service your DSG transmission. Now, I've heard some mention of people talking about putting DSG oil in the freezer or in the refrigerator to cool it down so that when you enter it into the system, it gets to the proper temperature. But here's where, where I think that this, that really is a mistake in understanding the intent behind the whole uh, level setting procedure in the first place and, and why I think it kind of negates it and makes it pointless unless you're going to let it sit overnight and start from zero degrees or basically very low and move up from there you're not properly going to be setting level perfectly and again this is important in, in saying I, I believe that this the uh, tolerance the error tolerance on the the level setting procedure between one and the other is very minimal so I don't have concerns over over that particular setup but what my what the specifics are is if you're filling between those level procedures if you're dumping in cold fluid all you're doing is essentially tricking the sensor on the transmission it's taking a hot transmission and the cold fluid you know it's kind of mixing together and it's giving you a reading that's lower than what the actual temperature is of the transmission but the whole point of the level setting procedure is for a, a, the, the casing and components inside the transmission as far as expanding and contracting. Things that are colder expand, things are, that are hot contract. So what you are going to be looking for is going to be, uh, I got that backwards, uh, things that are hot uh, expand, things that are cold contract. So what you're gonna be looking for at a colder temperature is going to be filling the fluid from that temperature. Now, if you're doing that and all the components in a transmission are hot, you haven't accomplished it just because you dumped in cold fluid and you know essentially tricked the sensor into giving you a lower reading, which makes you believe you've done something properly, but you haven't done anything properly because all the components of the transmission are not at the temperature that you're expecting to be filling at, which means you still haven't set the level properly. So bottom line is for me, unless you're not unless you're not leaving the vehicle overnight at a dealer or anybody who's servicing the vehicle, you're not properly setting the level. And without doing that, that's the only way you're going to get the level setting from zero to, to um, the proper temperature as fill. And then also something that's important to note, 
that that a lot of that that level setting procedure probably and this is part of the reason why i think this is even more of a concern is because cost is going to probably vary a little bit if you start changing the way that they're quoting the normal DSG services because now they're getting trying to be as competitive as possible with DSG services because this is the way they do them versus the level setting, double checking it, all that stuff. Now, again, I'm not, I'm not uh, advocating anybody for, for cutting corners. All I'm giving people is a reality of how things are being done. I don't think it's a concern with the way it's being done because it's being, been done that way for so long. If it was a problem, we would see widespread issues around every single thing, uh, which is not the case. So hopefully that shares a little bit of insight on that. But yes, we do have one coming with the level checking procedure included at some point in the future. Um, but also, if you didn't know, Charles actually uh, did reshoot a video uh, that, that explained that exact thing and shows you the procedure if you need that one instead. N1K Mike via YouTube says, I'd love to hear your thoughts. BAS4 versus Mark 6 Golf R. They're both around 20,000 now with 60,000 miles. All right, so BAS4 versus a Mark 6 Golf R. So uh, this is, uh, I like this question, it's a good question. Uh, for anybody not familiar, I've talked about previously, I plan to get a, it's probably gonna be a B8 and a half uh, S4 but it is something that we're looking at getting in the near future for a future project. Um, so this is kind of tough. Uh, Mark 6 Golf R versus a B8 S4. Yes, they're probably going to be similar in price. There's a couple things that I want to touch on. Overall, if you talk about just car to car, I would say a B8 S4 is a better car to own than a Mark 6 Golf R. Um, there are a few things that I have concerns around, and this is probably going to depend on the person as to which direction you want to choose. Uh, repairing a B8S4, while they actually tend to be pretty solid, the B8s had some, I know they had some uh, mechatronics unit issues that were kind of sporadic. Uh, S4s, they have uh, 3OT. The only real common, common issue on, on 3OTs are thermostats. Um, and then just general maintenance. But it is important to note that an S4 versus a, a Mark VI Golf R for maintenance, the, the S4 probably, if any type of surprise failures happen, they're gonna be significantly more expensive than what you'd find for a Mark VI Golf R. Uh, so general service stuff is going to be probably different. Uh, but if you talk about just straight performance, uh, Mark VI Golf R uses Haldex all-wheel drive. Uh, B8 S4s have a uh, the normal Quattro Torsen style. Uh, full-time all-wheel drive that's just a better system than Haldex, although Haldex gives you kind of the better fuel mileage day-to-day -day driving. That's going to, you know, Mark 6 Golf R fuel mileage versus a 3.0 T car. I would expect to get significantly better golf uh, mileage on the on the Golf R uh, than, than the other one. So those are kind of the factors. Power to power, BAS4 can put out more power more easily than, than the uh, Golf R with just a pulley and a tune, but keep in mind, and I'll link to it in the description below, but uh, tunes and pulleys are not cheap for S4s. Anything you're working with Audi, things like, you know, you wanna put a cat back exhaust, it's gonna be way more expensive on an Audi. You wanna do a tune on, on the S4, it's gonna be a lot more than what you would expect on a Golf R. So, you know, these are all factors that kind of come into play uh, when making decisions like that, if you are planning to be moddings. But uh, stock versus stock, they're probably kind of close, you know, a uh, the, uh, S4 probably has a little more luxury. I would say a Golf R is more practical because you can always fold down the seats and fit a lot more stuff. Hatchbacks are not, you know, the, the vehicle of choice in the U.S. for most people, but they are extremely practical vehicles because you can fit more than you would in any sedan, even if it's a much bigger car. Paul Walker via YouTube says, straightforward video, the old fluid looked fairly clean. I understood there is a gauze filter in the pump that collects the debris from wear in the diff pack plates. Would it not make sense to clear that out as well as part of the service? Paul? Is that you? It's been a long day without you, my friend. And okay, this comment was left on a video that I just put out recently talking about uh, performance pack differential service. We actually showed a DIY on how to do that. Um, and he talked about cleaning the Haldex screen. So. For anybody not familiar with Haldex all-wheel drive, what it is or how it works, uh, I have a video on that as well as a how performance pack differentials work. I'll link to both of those in the description below where you can check them out. But 
essentially they have a pump that that controls the uh, engagement and disengagement of the Haldex system. The later models, current, current Gen, I think it was Gen 4 and Gen 5, neither of which have filters that are serviceable, they do have a screen, which people have talked about and I've seen talked about in the past. I think somewhere on, uh, I saw a thing around uh, a golf R where people were removing it and they found some stuff on it and so they were cleaning the screen. Uh, I do think it, it's not a bad idea. It definitely can't hurt to do that. Uh, I think for the average person, it may not be the best choice just because my concern is that may be starting to open components that people shouldn't be messing with. And if you're starting to try to clean out a screen, I'd be super concerned that somebody might, you know, get a little too aggressive with it and kind of punch the screen through the pump. And now you need a whole new pump because you just punched the screen through the pump when you're trying to, you know, you're pushing on it, try to clean it and you know, you push the screen through or whatever. Uh, I don't know how likely that is to happen, but it is a concern of mine around that and, and how the X pumps are not going to be cheap to replace. And so I'm not so keen on telling people to mess with stuff that I'm not sure if they get damaged or not. Again, sir, removing this stuff is not a bad idea. It's just a matter of how viable of an option that is for everybody involved. Uh, and again, as long as you don't damage it, it certainly won't, won't do any harm to remove any contaminants from a system like that. Thank you so much for watching episode 115 of the Ask Dap Show, where I answer your Volkswagen and Audi questions. If you have any questions or comments about the questions answered in this show, be sure to leave it in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it.